start with the first thing that I want to mention is that this is not going to be a more serious talk. Uh, usually I have more specific topics that I want to talk on. This one is kind of like a little bit of an overview. It's not going to introduce you to functional programming, but it is going to introduce some concepts that might be interesting enough for you to naturally start learning functional programming. So, this, usually before I start, I first go through a couple of disclaimers. The first disclaimer is my favorite quote from Phil Lava. Uh, you should make your code readable because the people who are going to work on your project might know where you live and they're probably psychopaths. And since you're in the KD community, it's not most likely they're psychopaths because we all are. We, we all are. Uh, the second disclaimer is that I tend... <laughs> yes, Ken, you especially. Uh, <laughs> I tend to omit some stuff from the slides because it makes the slides too, too big to actually write the SPD column column and use constructs everywhere. So this is not production <coughs> ready code. Most of the code will be just for the presentation purposes to demonstrate the point. So there are a lot of things that we can learn from functional programming and apply it in C++ obviously. And usually when you ask somebody what is a functional programming, they tend to give you their own definitions. The problem is that if you ask two functional developers what is functional programming, you're going to get three different answers. And from my point of view, my answer is just the first part. I are other functions. So functions that can accept other functions as arguments or functions that return not values but another function. Apart from that, you have purity. I guess we all know what purity is. An immutable state. Okay, so purity, if you never change anything, so you don't write to a database, you don't blah blah blah. But those are all mathematical terms that I don't really uh, enjoy teaching. So, and since I have only half an hour, I'm definitely going to skip that. The reason why I got into functional programming is an evil language. Uh, a long, long time ago I had to write software for clients for Windows and obviously I used Linux. And I was a kid. I didn't know that C++ can be just compiled. Maybe it wasn't possible back then, but I, I had no clue. So I had to use a really strange language that I'm not even going to mention in the name. <laughs> and at some point that strange and evil language got a huge new version called 5.0 and a huge, it was a really huge release, so many new things like for loops that do read uh, but range for does, then you get try with resource because obviously they don't know about these structures and, and other stuff. And the problem that they had with that new release was that most of these things didn't really need to be in the compiler itself. So they needed to create a new version of the language, a new version of the standard to implement a compiler or something that in functional programming languages could be done just <coughs> in the uh, library level. In C++, we had higher order functions in some sense, we didn't have lambdas, but we had it since C++ was initially standardized. Since C++ 98, we had the algorithm. All the algorithms, well, most of the algorithms accept functions, predicates, or something. And some of them even return new functions, like std bind. Or, as it was called before, C11, bind first, bind second, or tr1, column, column, bind, that's, and similar things. And instead of the range for, we could have used just for each or boost for each. And it just implemented the same thing as the evil language did but on a library level, so without a single change to the compiler. And that's why I started investigating functional programming, because things like these, I love to extend the language that, I, that I'm working on. And obviously we had functional objects, well, we all know what functional object is. Well, functional object, a class with a call operator, it can be called as if it was a function. So if it works like a duck and walks like a duck, it's a duck. 
if you can plot something like a fun uh, in the same way that you call a function, it's a function. So the first level in the evolution of a functional programming uh, programmer is the abuse. So just use the tools that you're given in a completely unorthodox and evil way. So uh, the first thing that I started playing around with is the lazy evaluation. So C++ by default doesn't have lazy evaluation. The idea is, for example, just imagine you have a value that is really expensive to, uh, to calculate, like the answer to the meaning of life and everything. And you don't always need the answer. In some branches you will need it, in some branches you don't. And you can create a chain of if-else statements, you can create a function or something else, it would look ugly. Instead, you can just extend the language to support a new keyword called lazy, open brackets, close brackets, and you just define how the value should be calculated if it's needed to be calculated. And this is completely valid C++. This compiles and works, but how? So the first step is to create, obviously, a function object. It's called lazyval. As an implementation, it is going to get the function object as the template parameter, and it is going to store that function object as, as a member. And then, okay, we don't care about mutexes. We just need to de uh, define a cast operator to the result type of the function that we got. So, if you define the lazy well and pass it a function, it will extract the return type of that function, and it will create a casting operator to that type. As soon as you want to get that value, that value will, will be calculated, cached inside of the lazy well object. And since, uh, okay, before C17, uh, every time we had the template class, we needed to create a make blah 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 class function because the uh, template argument deduction didn't work for classes. Fortunately, this is fixed in C17, but we could have created make lazy val function and we could call it like this. But this is still quite ugly. The first slide that I showed was a keyword called lazy. And when we want to define new keywords in the language, what do we use? Macros. <laughs> Just like Qt does. Everything in Qt is a macro. So here we can define a really, really simple macro. So a structure called make lazy while helper that will just define the operator minus. Does anybody have problems with this code? This is really evil. So the <coughs> in the previous slide we had make lazy well and we had, had too many brackets and we hate brackets. How can we remove a single parenthesis from a function call? by replacing that function with an operator. Because when you call an operator, you don't actually need to open bracket, close bracket, right? So we are going to replace a function with operator minus. Why minus? Because Alexander Esco told me so. <laughs> so for some reason, operator minus is his favorite operator, so I decided to call it so. So what is the idea? We have the lazy object, and we have the operator minus. Whatever we pass to the operator minus will be the function of uh, the lazy calculation, right? And we just need to create a macro that expands to a minus and to a lambda hat. And after that we can normally uh, just write lazy. What will it do? It will create the helper instance then it will write minus, create the lambda head and everything that goes up towards is the normal C++ code. And this is the abuse part. And I guess it's quite obvious why it's the abuse. You're using the language for something that is obviously not initially meant to, uh, to be used for. But fortunately we have the evil macros and we have the operator overloading to abuse it as much as we want. And Apart from the fact that this is really an evil thing to implement in this way, it's really useful. Just like for each in Qt was really useful. 
again, a library feature. So the next step was, okay, so I kind of improved my normal imperative code, but it's still not functional programming. Okay, I have lazy, but that's just one single part of Haskell, and most of functional programming languages aren't even lazy, so it's not really functional programming. The main benefit from functional programming is that it, people who love on FP claim that you can write much shorter code than normal interactive developers do. So in 86, uh, this is one of my favorite examples, uh, Donald Knut was asked to write a program that lists the frequencies of words and writes out the most frequent words in some text. And the guy wrote a uh, Pascal solution, 10 pages long. It was extremely well documented, beautiful code with no data structures that he created just for, for that reason. <coughs> and after that, the ACM journal used to ask somebody uh, from the audience, again, some really famous uh, computer scientist, to give a critique of Donald Knuth's code. And obviously, when you get to critique Donald Knuth's code, you need to really, really have your uh, have this try, uh, try as hard as you can. And Doug McIlroy just sent a response with six lines of Unix shell script. So, 10 pages of beautifully documented Pascal code versus six lines of Unix shell script. Obviously, this wasn't as efficient as Donald Knuth's code, but just look at it. It fits on one slide and it's almost readable if you know Unix shell. And that's the point of functional programming. Unix shell and the pipes are really, really a functional concept. You have input, then you define a series of transformations which you want to apply to that input and you get the result. So apply a function, apply a function, apply a function, apply a function, you get the result. No thinking about for loops, where should I store the variables or anything else. In C++, this is obviously not going to be as short as this, uh, this example. But one of the things that, uh, that is becoming more popular is uh, the concept of ranges. Uh, who, have heard, who has heard of ranges? So the idea is, there is a huge problem with uh, standard algorithms and the, sorry, the problem is that all of the algorithms receive iterator pairs, return one iterator, which is not really composable or to be, to be honest, they are composable in a little bit different way than uh, what we would want So for example, if you wanted to filter out the collection and then sort the remaining items you will need to create a temporary vector to put the filtered items then you will need to sort it, then you will need to return it and that's not how functional programming works you should never be forced to create a temporary variable if you don't need it you don't need to force the compiler and explain ok, I need a chunk of memory so the ranges should solve the problem with the algorithms by just essentially joining two iterators into a single entity called the range. This is a little bit of a lie, but trust me. Uh, so, the idea is that if you have a range, you can pass it through a transformation filter, it will return a range. Then you can pass it to something else, then you can pass it to something else. You don't need always to keep the pairs of iterators. And how would you uh, deal with the problem that Donald Knuth had? You have a text, it's a range of characters, so it's some data. What can you do with it? You can replace all the special characters, commas, spaces and everything else with better chance to denote the end of the word. And you can do it, we all know the standard algorithm of transform. The algorithm on ranges does essentially the same but a little bit lazily and just provides a view it doesn't actually transform anything it's just a view over the original data when you traverse through the, through the view it will calculate each item when you need it 
The next step, because we want to count words, we don't want to be dealing with uppercase, lowercase, so let's transform everything to lowercase. Again, this do doesn't do anything. It's just creating a new view over the old view over the data. Something that IQ really likes. <laughs> Anybody who, who wants to tap on kicker and likes stacks of transformations don't like it. The task manager works. The next step, we cleaned up the data, so now we need to extract the words. We can just split the original collection over the backslash chance. And we get a range of words. Again, still no transformation happens. This is again just a view. You still have the original data structure, the ori original collection, and a couple of view defines over it. After that, we want to sort it, group all the same words. After sorting and grouping, just transform, keep the word and its count. Keep the word and its count. Again. And then again, sort so that we sort by frequencies. Reverse because sort will sort from 1 to, to maximum instead of maximum to 1. And then take as many results as we want. Most of these transformations are just views. So if you don't actually evaluate anything from them, they will never execute any code. The only different transformation is sorting. Because if you want to have a sorted collection, you actually have to access all the elements to check which is the minimum and then continue sorting. So if the ranges library wasn't a little bit misdesigned, this code would compile. And this would be the equivalent of 10 uh, pages in Pascal. So to recap, we have the data, we clean up the data, we separate all the words, sort the words, then group by, group all the same words into a range of ranges, and then count <coughs> for each of the words how many times it appears. Now this is less efficient than it can be. We could use a hash map for group by and count, but this is much more readable. Okay. And this is the solution that you will be usually shown in Pascal or with quite similar syntax. And uh, how, how much time? Uh, 15. Oh, I'm really fast. So the next step, obviously when you start shortening out your code, then you hear about this thing called uh, purity or immutability. And then you try to think of Okay, if I cannot change a single value in my program, how can I write anything useful? And it's something that is really hard to wrap your head around the first time that you see it. And I'm probably not going to help you, but maybe it will be interesting enough for, for you to, uh, to investigate further. So, if you... Yeah, I'm not going to talk about differential transparency. What's the problem with program state? Uh, there is a really nice quote by John Carmack of the Doom thing. Uh, he said that it's really difficult for us to think of all the states that our program can be in. And it's especially difficult when we have threading. So the fact that we have a mutable state, which can, can be invalid in some cases, which we need to control what locks, what unlocks, it's a little bit of a problem. If we don't want to care about uh, locking and mutexes, we have to have immutable data. If we cannot change data, we don't care if 10 different people are accessing it at the same time. So, just a simple function like this one has a lot of side effects. So, when the user clicks on something, what happens? Visible form becomes visible. After that, the data needs to be loaded, then we are connecting to the database to be able to show it in the, in the form, and then when 
the user clicks something or changes something in the form, it needs to connect back to the database. And this is becoming a little bit over complex with the arrows for a really, really, really simple example. So this is the idea of functional programming is that you should never access data from somewhere, that you should actually, if you want something done, you should ask the person who has the data to do it for you. And that's the, the rest part is that this is not only a functional thing. This is written in one of the most famous object-oriented books called Object Thinking by Alan Paul. So even object-oriented proponents think that we shouldn't mutate data but pass it on to somebody who actually does the work. And, uh, sorry, um, I lied. This is from somewhere, but I don't call from there. Uh, this is the thing that is from the book. So, uh, uh, David West calls all of us who write for loops and the usual, pro uh, usual programs to be uh, procedural developers. The fact that we are using classes and everything, we are mostly using classes for data uh, as a data container with some validation. We still are not thinking the, in the same way that object-oriented world should uh, force us to think. For example, if we wanted to create a class called the dog, we would first create getter, what is the height of a dog? We would create, create a setter, what is the height of the dog? Then we would create what is the color, set what is the color, and similar stuff. If you have a real dog, can you tell it, okay, your height is now 12 centimeters. Your height is now zero. Your height is now, I don't know, two meters. No, you can't change something that is incorporated into the dog. You can feed it, you can feed it, you can feed it, okay, it will grow up. But you can't tell it, okay, and now your color is red. Essentially, the objects, if you want object thinking, you shouldn't design them as simple or uh, data containers. And that's something that uh, really goes well with functional programming. And all of these quotes are actually from object-oriented people, not from FP. So, uh, besides that, object thinking will lead to object immutability. So, even object-oriented development will lead at some point to immutability, but the problem is how. This is the way we usually think about the world. If you want to change something, we change the world that we are in. The alternative where if you want to declare the world immutable, you cannot change this instance of the world. And this is something that has been covered in SF and in ancient Greek uh, philosophy. Every action that we take doesn't change the current world, but creates a new parallel one. So the idea, okay, flash. Uh, Whenever you want to change something, you shouldn't change this world, but you should create a new world with that change applied. In that way, if somebody still has, if somebody still lives in the old world, it can continue living in the old world. Nothing can still change. No mutexes, no data, mutable data sharing, no nothing. If you create a new mutable variant, it will again never be changed after that. Everybody who uses that one will always see the persistent data. Okay? So you can imagine something like a Git. All the previous revisions in Git are read only. Let's say. Uh, and the new revision that you create is the new world. If somebody still uses the old master, nothing changes. Okay? Uh, the problem is that creating new worlds is expensive. If you're all, always copying the data, the, copy, copying the whole world just to change one little thing, it is going to be really inefficient if you are using the normal data structures. The first thing that you can do is just to disallow copying and force the compiler to force you just to use moves. It will be legal because when you move from, a, from an object, if you're using it after that, it's undefined behavior. So again, there will be no data sharing for the mutable state. But again, 
this is just the syntax. Uh, how can you forbid somebody from copying the object and always having to write move when, when you want to change something. But again, this is not the point. This is something that would uh, force your compiler to essentially force you to think about changing the role, but it's not what is usually done in FP. In FP, instead of using normal data collections, you want to use persistent data collections. So, collections that are really extremely uh, cheap to copy, extremely cheap to copy with a modification. And one of the, I guess, most famous programs that does it is Photoshop. Why is Photoshop in my head is that uh, at some point the, the older Bald uh, said that he doesn't see any point in functional programming because how can I do anything if I can't change a single, uh, single value in my program. And he's working on Krita, the direct competitor to Photoshop. And that's the reason why I like to mention Photoshop as the example, because a simple, similar program just done in a completely different way. So how do persistent data structures work? First, we will start with a list, which is the worst data structure that, that you can imagine, but it's the simplest one to explain. If you have a list and you promise never to change this instance of a list, what is a list when you prepare an item to it? You get the old list, you get a pointer to just a new element which points to the old list. So the copy is extremely cheap. The program still has the old value, the program still has the new value. Okay? Okay? Yeah, yeah. sure. Not a few items, obviously. Hmm? Not a few items. Yeah, we are down to a penny. <laughs> Uh, if you want to remove an element, again, you don't need to do anything, you create a new list that is just pointing to the second element in the original one. Again, the data is being shared really, really efficient. Appending is the problem. You cannot just append a single item because it would change all the previous lists and we promised never to change any of them. So instead, if you want to append to a list, we will need to actually copy of the data. And this is one of the reasons why lists are really, really bad. The, obviously, the first is the cache localization. Lists are all over the memory, so you're going to get cache invalidation just by traversing through them. And the problem is that most of the uh, useful functions for a list are just totally inefficient. Just preventing and removing from the start are efficient. Everything else is around O of n. So, a lot of functional program, uh, programming languages are based on lists, and obviously they are a little bit slower because of it. Uh, some of them have started uh, investigating novel data structures, and one of the data structures that I'm going to talk about here is something called bitmap vector tree. The idea is that we want to create a collection that has the same uh, optimization, same uh, complexity for all the stuff like std vector. And it's not uh, enough, we also want it to be really, really cache friendly. So what can we do? Obviously cache is not infinite. Let's say cache can collect 32 items uh, of some type. So the idea is, if we have a few items in our vector, we are just going to have a bucket <coughs> with all of those items. It's cache friendly, right? It's a bucket in one place in memory, we can iterate through it, we can do whatever we want, we can add an element to it, we can remove an element from it. The problem obviously comes when you fill a bucket and you want to create another one. You will create a new bucket, again, when you access the first element, the whole bucket will go into the cache. So it's still cache friendly, even if we have two buckets. But now if we have two buckets, we need to be able to actually keep track of it. So we are going to create another level on top of it, which points to the buckets. 
again, the level above will also be a bucketed collection. So it's not an infinite collection in the top level as well. Again, it will have its own cache friendliness because it's a single mem uh, location in the memory. Then, if you just keep adding up, you're just going to get higher levels and higher levels of the structure. Now, in this slide, all buckets have the size of 4, which is definitely not the size that you would use in production. Usually, you have the size of 32, which makes the tallest tree will be around 6 or 7, uh, seven layers. And a lot of scientists uh, consider that to be not only effectively all of something, because it's a constant. You never go above seven. Seven times all of something is just all of something. So, what is the expense of appending an item to this collection? So, the number of layers <coughs> and all of, uh, all of one, which is in total all of one. Appending to this collection is the same as appending to the vector. Now, the, the question is we want to have efficient indexing as well, because vectors have efficient in indexing. How can we index all the items in the collection? Because the buckets have the size that is power of 2. We can use the bitmap representation of the index as the key which item in which level we should pick. So, for example, if we have uh, the number 14, which is 001110, and we have three layers of our structure, we can chunk the bitmap rep rep representation. We will have 00. zero it will be the index in the first, in the top level. Then we have 1, 1, which, will, which is the index in the element that we found by going to the first layer. The third element, then going to the last one, the index is 1, 0, and we have the access to the element with index 4, 14. Again, what is the complexity? The complexity is number of levels, which is never larger than 7 times O of 1, which is again O of 1. Okay? Yes. The next step is, uh, so far we have considered only mutating the original structure. We didn't talk about how to make them persistent. So all the previous versions should stay alive <coughs> if somebody is still using it. If you look at this picture, and we have appended P. What are the nodes that have changed in the original uh, tree compared to the second one? Hmm? Two blocks have changed. Two blocks. Just the path to the item that we appended. In the last one as well, even if we created a new route, the only items that have changed are the nodes on the path of the item that we have inserted which means that all the other items can be shared. So every time that you append something, you just need to create a new path. Again, what is the complexity of that? O of 1 because the path is bound by a constant. And it's similar for appending, prepending and... well, prepending it's not. Uh, what is the complexity of prepending? It's not shown in the picture. It's the same, isn't it? It doesn't really matter. Hmm? It doesn't matter if it's appending or prepending. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, it does matter. Because if you want to prepend something, you're going to prepend a whole bucket, and then you'll screw up all the indexes for the 32 or, right. or more. There are optimizations which do, uh, do fix that. But in initial initial state, you actually, if you want to insert an element to the front, 
you will have the same com <coughs> complexity like an STD vector. So it will be all of n. You need to create a new one with all the data moved. Well, couldn't you uh, put the modules on front? Yeah, there are different approaches to uh, creating efficient insertions in the middle to the top for con concatenations and everything else, which I'm not going to talk about. But essentially, the structure as shown is completely one by, by one as complexity is conserved with an STD vector. If you want to have efficient concatenation, you can either add the offset for the first element or something that is called a relaxed uh, bitmap vector tree which is an evil structure but really cool uh, instead of having a bucket containing just the elements the first element can be a special one that does something special but that's the most that I'm going to, uh, to say uh, at this time essentially the first item should point to indexes, starting indexes of all the buckets, the child buckets and that's something that currently so, uh, scale and closure use this thing with the start offset uh, the scale should probably move to the relaxed version in a couple of uh, versions and, okay, I'm going to skip to all of this so, if you compare this to a vector, uh, the ith indexes of one just like vector appending is of one just like the vector in normal case. Updating values since we have the direct line to any index we can efficiently audit. So it's also of one even in the immutable version. Uh, Prepending concatenation and inserting in the middle is obviously of n if you don't have the optimizations uh, obviously for more information about functional data structures uh, one of the best it's a little bit older book but it's still the, the book for, for this is written by Chris Okasaki it was his PhD thesis at some point and he expanded to, to a property so let's just return to this for a bit most of the data is localized, so it's cache friendly. It's a vector like structure that does the same thing as a vector but has really efficient copying. Copying with mutation. So it's even better than the original vector. This, is, this was a little bit of a lie, but. <laughs> Essentially, the problem with, uh, with it is that. Even if it's O of 1, it's 7 times O of 1. So you're going to get a slower access, but a constantly slower access. Uh, one library that implements this in C++, I think even the relaxed version, is called Emer. Uh, it's in, written in modern C++, it's recently uh, published, I think, a couple of months ago. And the last time that I did a benchmark, against the uh, GCC's STD vector for same amount of data, thousand or something elements the bars were really, 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 really close so it wasn't, it's really, it's implemented in a really nice way and has a couple of optimizations that I didn't uh, be nice to talk about and that's it the last slide is obviously uh, shameless self-promotion and thanks to all the KD people, Blue Systems and a few of professors.